we've got to say goodbye, and that's one of the hardest things to do down here is to say goodbye, isn't it? Because uh, God has us uh, different places that we're supposed to serve. But thank you for all the meals. Uh, thank you for all of the water from the Williams. They're trying to drown me is what they're trying to do. I don't understand that approach, but they are serious about that. But thank you for your faithfulness coming. And we've had just a great time uh, serving Lord. I'll leave in the morning go over to, uh, by Fremont. I'll be preaching in La Shara, uh tomorrow night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. And then I fly back to uh, North Carolina. And uh, so we're looking forward to days there. But I just want to thank you for your faithfulness here these days. 2 Timothy chapter 2 tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to start reading here. We're going to look at a couple other verses, another passage before I'm done tonight. But we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2 to start. And my title tonight is A Continuing Ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 2, A Continuing Ministry. Let's set the stage in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is the last book of the Bible that the Apostle Paul wrote chronologically. Uh, there's the debate about Hebrews, who wrote Hebrews, but uh, taking that off the table, the Apostle Paul wrote 13 New Testament books. 2 Timothy is the last one. In fact, he's probably within a year of his death by this time, maybe closer than that. And some people call 2 Timothy his last will and testament, his last words. It is kind of interesting how some many times in the Bible it seems like God gave these great servants the knowledge or the understanding that they were coming to the end of their life and ministry. For example, Joshua chapters 23 and 24 is Joshua's last address to the nation Israel. Those are some, pretty some impressive words. That we should think about uh, in our day and age in America when a president has finished his eight years in terms he gives like a last address to the nation if you remember President Reagan uh, just after he'd been president and then he developed Alzheimer's just before that happened if you remember he wrote a letter to America Do you remember that and he said that the greatest privilege of his life was to serve as president and then he said, now I start this long journey. It took him a long time before I actually passed away. But what he was saying was, this is my last communication to you. Those last words uh, in every relationship means a lot, don't they? Uh, maybe the last words that your mother or father spoke to you. I remember those. And uh, here's the last words of Paul to Timothy. But not only to Timothy... To us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The times are always changing, aren't they? When I was younger, my mom and dad used to love to go on a Sunday drive. I hated it. I absolutely despised it. I thought it was the biggest waste of time on the planet. My dad liked to look at the crops and my mom and dad would come along and they'd say, you see that over there? There was nothing over there. So we used to live in a house right there. And I would say as only a rebellious nutty kid could say, really? I don't see any house. Because there wasn't any house. It had been torn out. You know, farmland's too bad about Minnesota. If nobody's living in that house, they tear it down or burn it and farm right over top of it. You know, it's like a quarter of an acre. They can make money off of that. And we drive along. You see, see that over there? There was nothing to see. And I said, we used to live in that house. And I'd say, I don't see anything, right? And uh, I used to laugh about how things changed and how those old people, uh, they were just like so out of touch because times were changing. And then all of a sudden it dawns on me, guess what I am now? <laughs> you don't have to laugh that much. Huh? <laughs> you could have hesitated a second there. 
So like the church that I was saved in, the church that I was baptized in, that building's not standing any longer. The public school that I went to from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, that's not standing any longer. And a lot of other things like that. Things are always changing, aren't they? Sometimes you and I, we say, boy, they're changing at like lightning speed. Things are changing. We understand also how some things that were like legitimate businesses at one time just can't function today. My dad used to tell me all the time like he had different jobs and he was like the last person to have that job. Like this is something in farmland, all the old farmers in Minnesota used to have cows that they milked and they would take the milk to a creamery and every little town had their own and my dad drove for that. And then they decided that was inefficient, that wasn't up to date, that wasn't the way you do it. They tore down the creameries and that job was gone. After that, he had a job delivering Lando Lake's milk. Remember those guys, the milkmen? He'd get up about four o'clock in the morning. He, I think that's a thing that could still work today. I think you could make money on that. I'm not gonna try it, but I think you could. But anyway, it was a thing at one time. There was Lando Lake's and the other guy was Marigold. Marigold was from the pit of hell and Lando Lake's was heaven. You know, it was, that's what my dad sold. And then one day, he sold that business and that was gone. And so, but my dad had to constantly kind of reinvent himself to make a living. We understand how that happens all the time economically, don't we? There's things and it's just like, well, you can't, you can't make a living on that anymore. People can't do that. Now, here's the problem. We understand that the times are changing and we understand that economies change all the time, right? Right before our very eyes. And then we're sitting tonight in church and we say, but what about the church? It's kind of interesting, isn't it? See, a lot of people have said, the church, you're just like picking up the phone that's hanging on the wall. You're so out of date, nobody knows what you're talking about anymore. But here's the difference. The church is God's idea. The church is set up and God started this idea. Now, I totally understand our times are changing. I understand that. I understand people's lives are changing. I totally get that. But the idea or the concept of a church is not tied to a specific culture or a specific time. All right? Go back with me in your Bible. We're coming back to 2 Timothy 2. I'm going to preach there in just a second. But go back with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Now, there's a lot of theology in this passage. I'm going to skip just down to the point that I want to make. So you follow with me as I read. We're in Matthew chapter 16 in our Bibles. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus now is speaking. Now, follow with me. Matthew 16. We're headed to one specific verse, but i got to read the context and kind of get us where we're at here. Matthew 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, so once again, who's he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. Guess what? He's talking to us. We're supposed to be his disciples today. He asked, saying, in verse 13, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but whom Say ye that I am. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now there's a lot in that passage. I don't have time and I'm not going to take time to cover everything in that passage. But simply this, uh, two simple lessons here from Matthew 16, 18 is the verse I want us to think about. All relates to what we want to talk about. I continue to mention. The first one is, Jesus is not saying that the church is built on Peter. Okay? He's not saying thou art Peter, and upon Peter I'm going to build a church. That'd be something foolish to build a church on a man. He's saying thou art Peter, and upon this rock, or your confession, or what you say. What did Peter say? He said thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
He said, we're not building on Peter. A, a church built on Peter would have fallen apart. Any church built on a man will eventually fall apart. In fact, there's a large, there were in the last generation large, large churches in America. Ran in the thousands that today don't even have a building. Don't even exist. I suggest to you one of the reasons was they were built on a man. An effective man. A good man. A good preaching man. But when that man was gone, so was the church. But now look at this last phrase of Matthew 16. It says this. <clears throat> I will build my church. Jesus said, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All right, now, just look at me just for a second. All right, here we've got the church and we've got hell, okay? So we've got hell over here and we've got the gates of hell. What are the gates doing? The gates are protecting hell. All right, the gates are on the entrance to hell. So it says here that the church... Jesus said this, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. Jesus is the ultimate church builder. Now, what a blessing that we get to partake in this ministry, but he's the ultimate church builder. But the church is supposed to be on the offensive, attacking, trying to rescue people from him. The problem today is the church is not on the offensive, we're on the defensive. Everybody's against us. People don't like us. People do all these kinds of things. And we're on the fence. That's not what Matthew 16, 18 says. And it says, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Now, here's the difficulty. You know this and I know this. In reality, there's a lot of churches that used to exist that have closed down. And there's some churches that are still meeting in the same place, but they're preaching something that they different than what they used to preach. So you and I know that there are churches that it looks like they've been defeated. True statement, because we all know it in, in fact and in reality. But the idea of a church, the principle of a church, will not be defeated. Think about this tonight. We're on Wednesday night. We're on Purview night. I know you have Purview on Tuesday. A lot of independent Baptist churches have Purview on Wednesday night. Just think of how many churches across America are meeting tonight and worshiping the same Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's different numbers on that. I just read one guy who's traveled a lot in, in fundamentalism, and he said there's 15,000 independent Baptist churches in America. I don't know. The truth of it is there's many, many churches like that. There's many churches around the world today. They don't get to sit in a nice building like this. They didn't come into that building and say it's a little bit warm and they touch something and it starts feeling better. They don't have that privilege, but you know what they are? They're an independent Baptist church. So the idea of the church cannot be defeated off of this planet. Why? Because it's God's idea. It's not my idea. It's God's idea. And so we have all kinds of things. It, it, the economics of life changes. We all understand that. Things change. But over and above all of the changes, life changes, circumstances change, economy changes, above all of that, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. So the church is not only in the first century, the church is still here in the 21st century. It's kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? Sometimes when you get to a certain age, you start to say, well, it's just like everything's changing. I don't know what's going on anymore. I don't know who's in charge. But what Jesus said here in Matthew 16, 16, 18 still works today in 2023. I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, turn back there with me. I want to show you four characteristics of a continuing ministry. Here's Paul talking to Timothy. Paul is the older veteran saint. He's just about ready to be martyred. Those that's not described in the New Testament, but it's a record of history. Everybody that's ever studied the first century belie believes that uh, the Apostle Paul was martyred. He had about a 30 to 35 year ministry. Started all kinds of churches, three missionary journeys, wrote 13 books in the New Testament, great missionary statesman, great soul winner, great preacher, after he was saved in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. Now, Paul comes to the end of his life. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. What does he care about? 
He cares about us. He can't see Landmark Baptist Church in Logan, Iowa. But that's what he's talking about in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Not just Landmark Baptist Church, but every church that preaches the gospel, that stands for what's right, that wants to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's seen through the corridors of time all the way down to us. And what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 is not just to Timothy, it's to me. And it's to you. And he gives to us four characteristics of a continuing ministry. The first one I want you to see is in verse 2. It says this, the same message. Do you see that? The same message. Notice in verse 2, he says this, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Verse 2, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, the same one, the same message. The same message that Paul is preaching to Timothy, Paul intended Timothy to preach to the next generation, and the next generation to preach to the generation after that. It is the same message. Now, I think that's easy to get from the scriptures that we're supposed to preach the same message, but can I just say, we, we run counter to what people think today when we say our job today in 2023 is to preach the same message of the Bible. A lot of people are going to say, oh, you're just so out of date. You're so old-fashioned, you can't even relate to what's going on in this world. But no, the Bible says it's the same message. The gospel preached correctly. The gospel preached correctly and biblically applies to every person to every culture and to every age. It works in America and it works in Africa. It works in the big cities of America and it works in South America. It works in all kinds of small cities all across America and all around the world. Why? Because it's the same message. Why is that? Because it is God's message. It's not my message. My message, if I came up with my own message, it could go out of date quickly. But God's message was not intended to go out of date. It's the same message. So what the Apostle Paul preached in the first century, he intends us to preach in the 21st century. It's the same message. It doesn't change. You can't really say that about anything else. You know that? If, if somebody was saying, this is how to earn a living, this is how to make money in the 1940s. Well, it'd be, it'd be like a laughing stock today, wouldn't it? That doesn't work. You know what you're talking about. Why? Because that's man's message. Man's message isn't going to endure. endure. It can't endure. God's message was always intended to endure. God, who knows all things. We had that great song night. Yesterday, today, and forever. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. The theological term is the immutability of God, that God changes not. And we have to understand what is that message? And we have to give that exact same message today. It's the saving message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, first characteristic is the same message. Second characteristic in your Bibles there in verse 2, the same ministry. Notice what he says now. Let's read verse 1 as well. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me. Isn't that an interesting phrase? So here's what it's saying. Verse 2, are you there? Paul is preaching and Timothy is listening. He says, the things that thou hast heard of me. In other words, teach me. Uh, he says, preach to me. Uh, explain the Bible to me. Take the Word of God and open it up and show me what the Bible is saying and apply that message to me. So Paul is preaching and Timothy is listening. That's the same thing we should do today. Now, we should read our Bible on our own. We should have our devotions. We should have a time of prayer. We've got some good devotional books you can use that can be a help, that can be a blessing to you, can be an encouragement to you. But the important thing is for you and I to get in the Bible. And when we gather together in church, 
What we need is somebody preaching and teaching the Word of God. We need that. We absolutely need that. Now, we have education today, and education is kind of an interesting thing. Like, uh, every time that you turn around, they've got a new educational idea. It's really, it's really kind of a simple concept. You know, you're teaching something in a school setting, and you've got a teacher, and you've got a bunch of students. It's a simple concept. It's got pretty, compli pretty complicated. We've got all different kinds of ideas. But really, still, math is still math. History is still history. They put some twists in there, you know. English is still, I mean, it's just teaching. And learning. Here he says, Paul says, the things that thou hast heard of me. And Paul is not elevating himself. He's not saying that at all. But he's saying that the important thing is the message. God is giving out the message. That same message and that same ministry. Now, when I started pastoring, the first time I was pastoring, I was in 1982. I was 24 years of age and I looked like I was 14. I'm not making that up. I'm not exaggerating. I was made fun of a lot. I used to say, listen, that's all right. The day's coming when I'm going to be 80 and I'm going to look like I'm 60. My kids said that day's past. It's not a chance. It's not going to work out that way. That's what I live for all the time. You know, I mean, uh, I was going somewhere with a group of college students and one of the girls said, hey, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. She said, how old are you? I told her, she said, well, if you're going to just joke about it, you know. And I said, no, that's how old I am. No, you're not that old. She said, I do know how old I am. I'm not that bad, you know. <laughs> she didn't accept how old I was. And I said, remember that, you know that one fact we remember? They said, yeah. I said, he's like six months older than I am. She said, no, he's not. He's like 10 years older than you are. I said, I like you. I like you a lot. Your, your grades just went up, just like that. I'm going to go back on the computer and change your grades. You're going up, you know. <laughs> old age is kind of an interesting thing, though, isn't it? But anyway, here it is. Same message, number one. Number two, the same ministry. In other words, someone preaching and teaching the Word of God. That's an exciting thought, isn't it? Here's somebody who goes to the mission field. He's good talking to a bunch of people. If you go back and study the old time missionaries, many times they went to a group of people that didn't have a written down language. If you take Elizabeth Elliot, when she went in after the missionaries were murdered in January of 1956, the first thing she did when she went back in there with her young daughter was she started listening to their words and she started writing them down. She, first of all, produced a dictionary. Then she translated the Bible into their language. Uh, friends, that doesn't happen on a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> You're talking about years and years of hard work, and we're talking about somebody highly educated and highly trained and willing to go there. Uh, missionaries, other missionaries, when they went to a country, they went to a place, but what were they eventually getting to? They were eventually getting to the exact same thing that Paul said here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me. Now, the legitimate question is, as we carry on that ministry, this is a legitimate question, is the things that I am hearing, are they true to the Bible? That's a legitimate question. That's a legitimate question. In other words, we don't ever say, I don't ever say when I was pastor, well, I'm the pastor, what I say, go, no, no, we don't say that. We say, I'm the pastor, I get to preach, now we'll check, you get to check me by according to the Bible. That's all right, that's legitimate. I said, if you have a question about something, I don't have a problem with that. We're going to deal with the question, but at the same time, we're going to answer the question by the Bible. In other words, nobody is the authority around here except the Bible. We want to preach the Bible. And Paul is preaching to Timothy, and he says, In the things that thou hast heard of me. What we like in life is we like somebody that knows what they're talking about. When I first got to Fremont, I can't fix anything on my car, so I always need a mechanic everywhere I go. And so I, wherever I go, I'm still looking for one in North Carolina. I think I found one, but I'm not completely sure. I'm not convinced yet. But I had a, a, a mechanic in the early years of Fremont. He was a guy, he was a Vietnam War veteran. I eventually preached his funeral. And uh, <clears throat> he was disabled, and so he kind of liked to work on cars out of his garage, so it was a little bit cheaper. And he would, he would I'd bring my car in, and this is what I needed, Gary. I needed a guy like this. And he'd look at it. He'd look at it and he said, sell this thing today. And I'd say, why? He said, it's a piece of junk waiting to happen. Just get out. You know what I would say? I'd say, yes, sir. Why? He knew more about it than I did. You know that? 
if you don't have to explain it to me, just tell me what to do, and I'll be more than happy to do it, because I know that you know more about it than I do. And every time I did what he told me to do, I came out not ahead, but all right. Now, when I, after he passed away, I take the card and be thinking, man, should I put more money in this thing or not? And I would, and I'd regret it. I'd say, man, I need somebody to tell me what to do, because I don't know what to do on this card. You know? Every time I make a decision, I make the wrong decision. I don't know enough how to fix it. You know? One time I took a car in. I had a guy eventually I found as a mechanic in a garage, you know, good guy, you know. I walk in, we were like close personal friends. He had he had my credit card on file. I used to say I've sent that whole crew to the Bahamas several times out of my repairs. And he came in and said, Listen, we can fix that. I said, Good, how much? He said, But I can't. I'm legally not able to take that car and fix it. I'm legally not able to allow you to let you drive it off the off the lot. I said, wow, we get serious now. I mean, this thing's a piece of junk. I said, after what happened to my car, I drove it 40 miles to get here. So I don't know exactly what happened. But once again, we didn't have any choice. I accepted him. We said goodbye. The car and I had a little emotional moment. We had a word for her and I moved on. You know what I mean? But we all have those situations and circumstances. And it says this now, but it's talking about the Bible. And the things that thou hast heard of me. Now, we're not saying for a second, and don't take this, that everything that comes out of every preacher's mouth is something you go by. You've got to be able to check what the preacher says according to the Word of God. The Bible is the ultimate authority. The Word of God is what we'll bow down to one day. Now, God has used great people down to the ages, men, to preach the Word of God. And that same message in verse 2 leads to the same ministry in verse 2. Now, the, I want you to show you the third characteristic of this continuing ministry is the same method. Follow with me now in verse 2. I want to show you four different groups in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Follow it with me. And the things that thou hast heard of me. So Paul is the first group, first part. And he preaches to Timothy. Group number two, and he says, The same commit thou to faithful men, that's group number three, who shall be able to teach others also, group number four. Now think about it. Think about this in the church. Paul is the older man. Paul is almost to heaven. He's not there yet, but he's going to be there soon. Timothy still has years to serve the Lord. And he says, Timothy, you listen to what the Apostle Paul said. Now, it is kind of interesting because we know in the first century they're living in a very primitive time period. They're living in a time period in 2 Timothy where the entire New Testament hasn't even been written. And even the parts have been written. They didn't get to carry it around in a handy little thing like we do today. They didn't have access to all of those things at the same time like we do today. We're not even talking about all the study helps that we have. But Paul is expecting Timothy to listen to what he said and to apply it. Now, what was Timothy supposed to do? Timothy was supposed to preach that same truth to who? faithful men. Faithful men. And then what was that group supposed to do? Teach others also. All right, now, in our day and age, in America, modern day America, the one that you and I lived in, most of us know three generations, right? I never knew my great grandparents at all, but I knew my grandparents. My last grandparents passed away when I was in high school. Three generations spans 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, right? Uh, when my uh, oldest daughter in 2010, i got to get this right, 2010, had her first child, I said, when you have that first child, it was born in Florida. I don't understand that. I'm bitter about that. But anyway, our grandchildren were all born in Florida and all live in Florida. Uh, don't even like coming up north, but it's all right. We'll deal with them. God will get a hold of their heart one day. I understand. But in 2010, I said this to my daughter, Debbie. I said, listen, as soon as you can, you have to get back to Nebraska so we can get to Minnesota so we can take a four-generation picture. My parents back then were still alive. And I said, as soon as you get here, we're going to say hello at the airport. Then we're going straight to Minnesota because I want a four-generation picture. That's a special thing. You know that? I've got it. I've got it. I've got my mom and dad and me and my daughter and my granddaughter. That's a special thing. You don't get many four generation pictures today. Now, sometimes you get a five generation picture. I'm never, I'm never going to get that. That's special. You know what I mean? Uh, my son Daniel, they had their first child in 
January of 2013. I said the same thing to him. I said, you get up here as fast as you can. We're going to get another four generation picture. Then what we got was we got four generations of Lucan men. My dad, his name was Robert, me, my son Daniel, and his first son, which was Jackson. And we're going to have a picture of four, four generations of Lucan men. Now, I don't know about you, but my small hometown newspaper, you can get those pictures on the front page. We did it. The four generations of the Lucans, and then the four generations just a couple years later of Lucan men. Hey, that's special to me. Do you know that? That spans a long period of time. All right, now, three generations living. Now, but this is talking about four different groups of people. Now, think about this with me. All right, stay with me. So here's what we have. We have Paul. He's the old veteran. He's about ready to go to heaven. He's preached for 30 years plus. He passes the baton to Timothy. Now, Timothy was not a young, young man by this time in 2 Timothy. There's all kinds of debates about it, mid-30s to early 40s, something like that. He's not just a teenager or anything like that. He's traveled with the Apostle Paul, but he's definitely younger than Paul. Paul and then Timothy. And Timothy takes that same truth. Now, once again, we're not talking about something he got on a video or a DVD or a cassette player, even, or even real to real if we go way back. What are we talking about? We're talking about what he heard what he digested, what he took up, and he preaches it to that next group, faithful men, all different ages in a church. And then, now Paul has gone to heaven, and Timothy has moved over. He's the older saint. The faithful men, what are they supposed to do? That same truth is supposed to go to that next generation. Now, there's all different kinds of ages in group three and group four, right? There's the faithful men that could be all different ages. In our society today, that could be anywhere from somebody that's 25 to 85, right? 105. And then you have that next group. So what do we have? We're taking truth and we're passing it from one generation, Paul, to Timothy, to the next generation, the faithful men that teach others also. So you see what God is trying to do? God is trying to get a church, that's where we are tonight, to continue how? How do you continue? The same message, the same ministry, and the same method. We take it from one generation to the next, to the next, and to the next. And what are we talking about? We're talking about Bible truth. This generation over here could be 50 years removed from the Apostle Paul. There's going to be people in this gener this group right here, they never even heard the Apostle Paul preach. Somebody said, you never heard the Apostle Paul preach? He says, no, no, I got saved after he was already in heaven. Oh, you should have heard the Apostle Paul preach. He was a persecutor, and then he became the preacher. Oh, you should have heard him preach. You should have heard him tell about the persecution he went through. You should have heard the stories the Apostle Paul had. And this person said, well, I, I never get that. Why? Because they're 50 years removed from the Apostle Paul. 75 years what does God intend for her to do? For us to just close up shop and go home? No. He, he intends for the church to continue. That's exactly what he intends for it to do. He intends for the church to have a continuing ministry. And we have in that verse, verse 2, we have four different groups. Strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I want to give you four qualities that are supposed to be in me and you. If we're going to serve the Lord. First of all, it says in verse 1, to be strong. And we talked about that out of Joshua chapter 1 the other night. But it's not the idea of being strong. It's the idea of being strengthened. It's the idea that our, the strength is not in me. The strength is not in you. The strength is rather in verse 1. It's in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I don't, I'm not strong because of who I am. I'm strong because of who Jesus Christ is. I don't get my strength from myself. I get my strength from the Lord Jesus Christ. If I ever start to rely upon myself, the Lord does maybe make me fall flat on my face so I can learn that my strength comes not from me, but from the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ wants to use us. He wants to use our different abilities, our different talents. But he says, first of all, if you're going to be what God wants to be, you need to be strong. You need to be strengthened. Notice secondly in verse 3, it says, Thou therefore, Paul talked to Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardness. We may have a difficulty with that. I don't like things that are hard. I like things that are easy. My entire life, I tried to stay away from hard things. If you told me something was hard, I would run away from it. Why? Because I don't like hard things. Why? Because they're hard. I like easy things. Absolutely I do. 
And to tell the truth, all of us are like that to a little bit. But here he's talking about the ministry. If you're going to be in the ministry, you're going to have to endure some hard times. You're going to have to endure some difficulties. You're going to have to endure some challenges. It's inevitable. It's easy to be pleasant when life goes by to the song, but the man worthwhile is the man who can smile when everything else goes wrong. Can we endure hardness? Can we go through a hard time and say, I'm going to trust the Lord in the middle of this hard time. I'm going to rely upon Him. I'm going to draw strength from Him. I'm going to ask the Lord to help me, to give me strength, not to remove the trial and the difficulty, but maybe to give me the grace to go through that trial, to trust in Him. Listen, you and I know anything worthwhile having today is going to involve some work, some struggle, some difficulty. And can I just say this? Anything worth having in a church, in a good church, in a good ministry, is going to involve some difficulty. It's going to involve some trial. It's going to involve some challenges. One Sunday, early in my time at Fremont, and I went in 92, and uh, any time before 96, I would have taken the first train out of town, or bus, or any way out of town, but the Lord would not let me get on the train or the bus. I tried. The Lord would not let me go. One Sunday, early on, uh, back then we had Sunday school at 10, we had church at 11, the service ended at 11.59, the entire building was cleared out at 12 o'clock. That's when you know it's not the best church when they clear out that fast, you know what I mean? But anyway, and I was sitting in the back view. My wife was at the house, we lived right next door in the park street. We had two little kids at the time. And I was having a pity party on the back bench, but the Lord was not participating in my pity party. I was telling the Lord how rough my life was, and the Lord was not listening. And I was telling the Lord how it was time to remove and get me a different place, and the Lord was not listening. As I was sitting there waiting for my wife to get ready for lunch, a man walked in. Had been in church. I stayed another, I stayed 26 years eventually. The, the entire time that man was in that church, five times, something like that. He came in, he sat down. I knew who he was. He said, Pastor Lucan, I got a problem. I said, okay. And he asked me a question, simple little question, and I solved it. And I, I'm not that solved, but I explained to him what I would do and stuff like that. And he said, man, he said, that's good. Thank you very much. And I said, can we have a word of prayer? He said, sure, go ahead. So I prayed, and he left. And then it's like the Lord spoke to me. Now, not in an audible voice, don't get worried about me or anything like that. But the Lord's trying to teach me something. Here's what the Lord said on that Sunday morning. He said, you know, there's a ministry here. If you're tough enough to find it. There's a ministry here. You're going to have to stick it out though. I don't want to hear all this hardness stuff. I'm sick of the hardness stuff. I want some easy stuff. But you know what the Lord said to me that day? There is a ministry. You know what? The Lord was true to his word. There was a ministry there. I couldn't see it in 93 or 94. I can barely see it in 95. And one Sunday in 96, I was sitting on the platform, and the Lord said, Hey, are you watching? And I had to say, Yes, sir, Lord, you're right. I was wrong. Now, that's not, I'm not saying like there was no more hardness after that. Because you know and I know life is kind of filled full of hard things. And the ministry is filled full of hard things. I honestly, seriously, I feel sorry for people that run every time there's difficulty. Because you never learn anything. Uh, in other environments, we would call those people immature. We can't do it because uh, people get so offended at it, but it says endure hardness. Notice he says in verse 4, No man that boreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life. So be careful what you allow to entangle you, to control you. Here's the last thing. It's purpose for everything that he says in the Latin, and it finishes in verse 4. That he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Hey, you and I are supposed to be soldiers. You say, well, I didn't, I didn't sign up to be a soldier. Well, a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, you signed up for when you got saved. You got saved. God gives you heaven. He wants you to serve Him. He wants you to live for Him. 
I don't think that's a stretch, is it? I don't think that's unreasonable for God to say, I'm giving you salvation. I'm giving you a home in heaven. Now serve me. I need some soldiers today. And what we should do as a soldier is we should please Him who has chosen us to be a soldier. What we need is a continuing ministry. And if we could have this, we could have all across America. I understand that's a challenge. It didn't say it was easy. Anything worth doing at all is going to be a challenge. But we could have churches. All across America. I think God intends for us to have gospel preaching churches, Bible preaching churches, where the Word of God is supreme, where the Word of God is exalted, where the Word of God is lifted up. We have to have, we want to have a continuing ministry, but we have to have people that will continue. That's me and you. Just think what it was like for Timothy. He had followed the Apostle Paul soon. He's going to watch the Apostle Paul's head being cut off. I don't know. Sounds pretty tough to me. What we see in Timothy, though, he just kept right on preaching. Kept right on serving. That's what God wants me and you to do, to serve him. A continuing ministry. Verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, the same message, commit thou to faith. Heavenly Father, thank you for the I word tonight. Take and use it in our lives, Lord. We need you tonight. And Father, how I thank you for this church, for these dear folks, for this pastor, his wife. Lord, we pray your richest blessing upon this church. We thank you for all the work that's gone into this, this building, this church, this place before. We thank you for this week. Lord, I pray that you would take and use it in each one of our lives. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would say to you, Lord, sincerely, what is it that I need to do to be a part of a ministry, of a church that continues? Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to be what you want us to be, dear Lord. Lord, work in our heart and life. Lord, may we be willing to say, Lord, you put your finger on my life in any, any area and I will respond in humble submission. I want to be used for your honor and for your glory. Lord, do a work tonight in our life. Lord, I understand it's a battle for a church. I, I understand we're in difficult days. We all understand that. But at the same time, we have all, all the promises of the Bible and all the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you'd use it in each one of our lives, Lord. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. Let me ask you this question. You've heard the challenge tonight. And maybe there's some area in your life that God spoke to you about and said, this is an area that I need you to commit to me. This is something that I need you to do. Maybe you hear this this evening. And maybe you've been a little bit slack about praying for you. For your church and for your preacher. Oh, well, I could use that. Maybe you hear this this evening, maybe you're just a little bit discouraged and you know, so things have been hard here recently. I think you heard the challenge tonight. You gonna live for God, it's gonna be hard from time to time. But once you got glad God gives grace. Mm -hmm.